going to be before you long, but please take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Regardless of the version you have there, you'll be able to follow along with me, but I will be reading from the, uh, from the English Standard Version. 1 Kings chapter 18, and I would like to start at verse 41. I'll read now. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to, Mount, to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again, seven times. And at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rains stop you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Let's carry on into chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life. For I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too, hard, too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food. Mm. In the strength of that food. Forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak 
and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, <clears throat> Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king of Assyria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola, you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelve. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him, or as the King James Version says, and ministered to him. There I will stop in the reading, but please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to call you our Father. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. May you be set apart in this sermon as holy. May you be magnified in the hearts of your children. And may your word come to them from my lips, sharper than the two-edged sword that it says it is. Encourage your children for the spiritual warfare that they are fighting at this hour. If these are the days of Elijah, then indeed these are the days when we need the encouragements that he received from you to fulfill his ministry and the calling upon his life. So Holy Spirit, come. Come in power. Illuminate your word to your people and let a life-changing effect go forth from it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is a slightly strange preaching uh, to a congregation I cannot see, but nonetheless, uh, I trust your engagement with the scriptures. I'll encourage you to have your Bible there open in front of you because I wish to say no nothing this morning apart from what the Bible says. And I wish you to see and hear the voice of God from the scripture as though you had read it for yourself and pondered the few thoughts that I'm going to bring for yourself. You know the story of Elijah well. In chapter 17, God calls him from Tishbe, a province, sends him to Samaria to the court of Ahab, to bring down judgment. And he says to Ahab, it shall not rain unless I say so. This is in judgment on Ahab and Jezebel for having led Israel astray and away from God to the worship of Baal and Asherah. And the Bible says, as, we, as you could read in chapter 19 later, that Ahab did more to lead Israel astray than all the kings 
that had come before him. God sends Elijah to Zarephath, where a widow will look after him. And before that, he sends him to a brook in, in Kishon, uh, Kidron rather, and the ravens bring him food. And he drinks from the brook until it dries up. Notice God does not take Elijah out of the context of the judgment of God, but sustains him in the middle of the judgment that is falling upon Israel. That's a revelation for somebody. Sends him to Zarephath to the widow, miraculously sustains him there. The widow's son dies, but Elijah prays and the son is raised. Three and a half or so years later, God sends him back to confront Ahab and say, it's going to rain. Gather all the prophets, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah on Mount Carmel. And there is a great showdown in which God sends fire that totally consumes the sacrifice and the altar and the wood and the water. Baal can do nothing. Asherah can do nothing. And there is a great declaration of the nation of Israel. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah leads the nation of Israel in repentance and rededication to God and slays the prophets of Baal. God will not tolerate sin. And that's where we pick the story up here, turning back to chapter 18, verse 41. And the first question I ask myself is, who is in charge here? For chapter 40, verse 41 of chapter 18 opens with these words, and Elijah said to Ahab, it is not the king who is in charge, but the man of God. The game has changed since God's fire fell from heaven. And Ahab does Elijah's bidding. For those of you who are running the sermon slides, could you please have the slide with the um, different perspectives? I'd like us to see, as we dig into this text, how the same circumstances being viewed from different perspectives, different viewpoints by the different uh, protagonists. Elijah says to Ahab, go up, eat, and drink. We do not see here, after the dramatic events of chapter 18, which I trust you know so well, we do not see here a king leading his people in repentance. We don't see here a king leading his people in rededication to God like David had done, like Solomon had done, or like Josiah would do generations later. What a contrast. Elijah says to Ahab, go up and eat while I go up Mount Carmel to pray. In chapter 18, verse 37, Elijah has prayed, God, you who changes hearts, you who turns hearts back to you. God, the heart turner, has been at work, but Ahab's heart is unchanged. Go up, eat, and drink. Look what he says to Jezebel at the start of chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. An account of Baal and Asherah's impotent silence. An account of Elijah's nobility and unwavering faith. An account of the simplicity and majesty of Elijah's prayer. An account of the drenching of Elijah's sacrifice so that the demonstration of God's power would be beyond doubt. An account of the fire that fell and of the people's declaration. That Jehovah, he is God, and by implication, Baal is not God. Asherah is not God. And so he runs home and says to his wife, it's over. It's over for us. Elijah has killed all the prophets with the sword. Who wears the trousers in this relationship? Well, it is Jezebel, as you can find out in chapter 21. Ahab is spineless before the Lord. Ahab is spineless before his wife. He does not repent. He doesn't stand up in his office as head of state, as king of Israel, and provide godly leadership to his people. 
Go up, eat and drink. On the other hand, we see Elijah going to Mount Carmel to pray and read in verse 42, he bowed himself down to the earth and put his face between his knees, the posture of prayer. And then he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And his servant goes and looks and says, there's nothing, but Elijah sends him back seven times. Allow me to say this folks, spiritual vision and God-given insight are sometimes out of step with the situation. The heavens are bare of clouds. But the godly man, Elijah, he acts based on what God has revealed. It is going to rain. He acts in faith that that which he has seen in the spirit will be revealed in the natural. Are you like Elijah's servant? Do Pastor Noah and the other pastors of the church week by week bring you the word of God, envisioning you to, for what God could do through the ministry of breakthrough, but you just don't see it? Can I ask you, get behind the man of God. Get behind your pastors. Get behind your elders. Get behind your deacons. Get behind the vision that they see. Because rain is coming. Blessing is coming. A harvest is coming. And you need to know your place in it. Be humble enough to take direction. Even when it looks like there is no cloud in the sky. Even when it looks like the way they're asking you to serve. Will, it seems to be achieving little or nothing. Keep serving. Keep listening. Follow the mandate that the men of God over you have given you. Because blessing will come. Because rain will come all that by way of background let's pick things up at chapter 19. yes different situations diff same situation different perspectives you always want to have gods chapter 19 verse 1 ahab told jezebel all that elijah had done <clears throat> and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword and jezebel sent a messenger to elijah at the height of his ministry, at the height of the action of the power of God in his life, Jezebel sends a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, verse 3, and he arose and ran for his life and came to be a Sheba, Beersheba is the southern limit of the land of Israel. He could not have run any further and stayed within Israel. He ran to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. You know, folks, hindsight is a wonderful thing. We can look back on this prophecy and see here that Jezebel seals her own fate. For God, and not the gods, would do to her, and more also, for she would not succeed in getting to Elijah. The account of her gruesome death is recorded in Second Kings chapter 9. It is truly horrible, and not the kind of thing you'd wish on your worst enemy. Jezebel speaks, Elijah runs for his life. Because he does not hear that Jezebel has just prophesied about her own gruesome end, about the judgment of God on her. Elijah hears, I am going to kill you. And yet the word of God is, Jezebel is going to die. At the height of his ministry, at the height of his powers, at the height of the work of God in bringing Israel to repentance, the man of God checks out because his discernment lets him down as fear overwhelms him. God is present. God is at work. God is there the whole time. <clears throat> God doesn't check out because the king and queen are furious. God doesn't wimp out because a threat has been issued. 
God doesn't cower in the face of opposition. God is at work even in the very words of those who oppose him. Jezebel will die as she has said she will. And yet, the man of God at the height of his ministry checks out. The man of God at the height of his ministry wimps out. The man of God at the height of his ministry cowers in fear in the face of opposition. The man of God at the height of his ministry does not discern the voice of the Lord through his enemy. <clears throat> the same servant who heard and spoke a clear word about a famine the same servant who had been miraculously sustained by God throughout the famine. The same servant who had witnessed God's power displayed on a national platform. Verse 3, he was afraid and arose and ran for his life, came to be a Sheba, left his servant there. He himself goes a day's journey into the wilderness, sat down under the juniper tree and asked that he might die. It is enough, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Folks, I bring you a cautionary tale that just when you can sense the hand of God at its heaviest upon you, Satan may pull the rug from under your feet. I am slow, however, to pontificate over the struggles and failures of a fellow believer. Lord, keep me in prayer for those saints who have very visible and very prominent ministries. Lord, how true the words of your servant Paul in Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Baal and Asherah were silent at Mount Carmel because God would not have Satan and his demons speak. This time, however, they find a voice in Jezebel and the man of God is thrown completely off balance. Paul would say to his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And yet the contrast couldn't be clearer. For here we see paralyzing fear in Elijah, hate from Jezebel, and a loss of poise and self-control in the man of God, which makes him run for his life. Can I suggest to you folks that first and foremost, the Christian walk is spiritual warfare. I was so pleased that the praise and worship team sang because we are at war. The battle is first and foremost a spiritual one. It is not the threats of a queen. It is not the threats of political power. It is a spiritual battle. And I say to you, you may be in a similar place of despair or of sheer spiritual exhaustion that Elijah found, found himself in. Verse 4 of chapter 19, read with me. He went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and asked that he might die. And he lay down and slept. Is there an aspect of what you're going through that is spiritual warfare. Can you not bring yourself to pray or read the scriptures or fellowship with other believers 
or encourage another believer or continue to make your faith known in your workplace or your social circle or pray with your spouse and your children or serve in some form in the local church or give of your time and your energy and your money to another person to another need that you can clearly see have you cut yourself off elijah remember abandons his friend his servant have you cut yourself off from christian fellowship from the affection of friends and family who know you well from the wise counsel of somebody near and dear i ask you do you question your circumstances and wonder why it can be so unrelentingly hard for a child of a powerful god elijah did in chapter 19 verse 10 he said i have been very jealous for the lord the god of hosts for the people of israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars killed your prophets with the sword and i even i am left and they seek my life to take it away do you find yourself in a similar place this morning to elijah the reasons may be varied the reasons may be complex but may I suggest to you that one, in the context of this passage, is that the Christian, by virtue of their allegiance to Christ, is in a state of war. In a state of conflict against a foe who resents the Christ you love and serve, and who, unable to defeat Christ, will attack you, Christ's most treasured possession. A publicly humiliated enemy is a dangerous one, as Elijah finds out. See, folks, God, not Satan, is honored every day you live as a Christian. God, not Satan, is honored every day that your marriage continues. God, not Satan, is honored every time you make a decision that puts Christ first. God, not Satan, is honored every day that your children or grandchildren live as believers. God, not Satan, is honored every time you choose or act righteously rather than sinfully. God, not Satan, is honored whenever your faith is tested and you come through in a God-glorifying manner. God, not Satan, is honored whenever you take a stand for Christ in any context with non-believers. God, not Satan, is honored when in any way and in whatever form your suffering is for the sake of Christ. Amen. Is it any wonder then? Is it any wonder then? That at Christ's transfiguration, it was Moses and Elijah who stood and talked with him. I, I really want you to grasp this because it has practical ramifications later. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 9. And we will read from verse 22. Luke chapter 9. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Luke chapter 9. I'll actually start at 21. I'm reading again from the ESV. Uh, Luke chapter 9 verse 21. Jesus uh, strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. Uh, Peter has just had a revelation about Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says in verse 22, The Son of Man must suffer many things, must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. See, the mission is gruesome. The mission that Jesus had to accomplish on the cross for you and me, it was gruesome, it was agonizing in execution, but it was glorious in its final outcome. And so may the spiritual, might the spiritual battle that you are fighting today be gruesome, agonizing. But my encouragement is that it will be glorious in its final outcome. On the third day, Jesus would be raised. Let's read on, verse 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily 
and follow me. Allow me just to stop there and say that there may be somebody under the sound of my voice who has made peace with sin in some way. The word of the Lord to you this morning is if you're going to go after Christ, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. For some of you, this is the verse that is going to, even in this moment, break the yoke of sin in your life. And for some of you, this is going to be the verse that starts your journey of restoration. Verse 24, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. See, there is a cost to following Christ, but he doesn't ask you to walk a path he himself has not trod. He is not asking you to wage a spiritual warfare he himself has not fought. You can go the distance in the things of God because Jesus himself did. But I really want to take up verse 28. Now about eight days later, eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. His clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him. Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of what? Spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. This man who had run away from Jezebel in fear. God would do his work in and choose him to be one of those people encouraging the Savior at a time of great spiritual earnest in our Lord Jesus. And God picks Elijah and Moses. Both men understood what it was to have the call of God on their lives. Both knew what it was to stand for Yahweh, the true God, on a national platform. Both knew what it was like to have to speak truth to those with social, religious, and political power and influence. Both Moses and Elijah were witnesses to extraordinary demonstrations of the Lord's power. Both knew what it was to live and work under the threat of death. Both had to stand their ground when opposed by the demonic pagan religious practices of their day. Moses knew what it was like to fail at very nearly the last hurdle, to see the promised land but from a distance, never to be reached. Elijah knew what it was to have an enemy who wouldn't yield even in the face of such defeat as Baal and Asherah had experienced at Mount Carmel. To have an enemy who, in the moment of greatest triumph, of national proportions, in the moment of victory, could deal a paralyzing blow. Is it any wonder then that God picks him to encourage our Lord Jesus? Elijah knew the God who stepped in to restore, as we read in our text. Allow me nonetheless to return to today's passage in 1 Kings chapter 19. Turn back there and turn to verse 5. But just allow me to interject here and say, Jesus is not asking you to walk a road he himself hasn't walked. Jesus knows what it's like to need encouragement. And God in his infinite wisdom brings two men who know what it is like 
to capitulate. As an encouragement to you, you are not alone in the spiritual warfare you are fighting. So how does God go about restoring Elijah? Because that's the encouraging bit. That's the bit that we all need to hear. We know we're in a spiritual battle. What does God do to encourage his man? And for those of you running the slides, it's the next one. Indeed, the one before that. Chapter 19, verse 5. He lay down slept under a broom tree and behold an angel touched him and said to him arise and eat and he looked and behold there was at his head a cake baked on hot coals and a jar of water and he ate and drank and lay down again verse 7 and the angel of the lord came again a second time and touched him and said arise and eat for the journey is too great for you and he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to horeb the mount of god how does god go about restoring elijah how will god go about restoring you number one god's nourishment god's nourishment god provided elijah with what he needed to go to the place where the work of restoration could happen God gives him what he needs to get to his prayer closet, to get to his prayer cave in this case. In the context of spiritual warfare and spiritual weariness and spiritual exhaustion, even getting to the place where you can pray, even getting to the place where you can pour out your heart before the Lord, even getting to the place where you can then receive from him, takes strength which only God can give. And saint, strength which God will readily, generously, happily give. This is the testimony and encouragement of Elijah and of Moses and of Jesus. Even when you cannot bring yourself to pray, say, Holy Spirit, bring me to the place where I can pray. Because that is what God does for Elijah. In the strength of that food, he goes 40 days to Horeb, the, mouth, the, the, the mount of God. How does God, God go about restoring his man? Number one, he quietly, gently, nourishingly reminds him that he is there. He does for him exactly what he did at the very start of his ministry. And he's able to go 40 days to Horeb, 40 days in which to remember, 40 days in which to rehearse, 40 days in which to experience again God's life-giving nourishment. The psalmist would put it this way in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God reminds Elijah that he is there. He is present he never left. Elijah ran, sat under the juniper tree, begged to die, and God says, have some food. I am here. I am present. I, am nev I have never left. The presence of God is not something we conjure up in praise and worship. It's not something that we have to work up esteem for. He is Jehovah Shammah, the God who is there. So, number one, God nourishes him. Number two, God talks with Elijah. 
verse 9. Then he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? See, when you're spiritually tired and worn out, it's easy just to take up your phone and flick on Facebook, WhatsApp, whatever social media. It's easier to let the television talk to you. It's easier to let the worship music play in your car. But God wants to bring you his word. It's not as easy, is it, to take up your Bible and open Psalm 23 and let the tears fall from your face. As you eat this, the nourishment of the word of God, in the strength of which you can go 40 days in the place of prayer. He comes to a cave, he lodges in it, and the word of the Lord comes to him. And says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I'm the only one left. And he says exactly the same words again in verse 13. Folks, God talks with Elijah. He doesn't talk at him. He talks with him. God speaks and leaves the space and the room for Elijah to speak. God hears him out. God, God does for him what Baal and Asherah could not do for their prophets or for the Jezebel who was breathing down Elijah's neck. God talks with Elijah. See, prayer is the chief prerequisite for spiritual warfare. And I want to point out three simple things about prayer. Prayer is a deliberate act. You decide to pray. You make up your mind to pray. You go to a place of prayer. It is a deliberate act on our part. But here is the blessed thought. It is a deliberate act on the part of God. The God who has need of nothing meets you in the place of prayer. Prayer is a deliberate act. But secondly, prayer is a necessary act. Because in this setting, and no other, we see Elijah being restored. Listening to sermons played back in your car or at home has its value. Listening to worship music has its value. Talking things through with a wise saint has its value. But none of these things are a substitute for prayer. Prayer is a deliberate act on your part and God's. Prayer is a necessary act. But thirdly, this kind of prayer is a private act. It is an intimate act. Behind closed doors, away from the public gaze, as the child of God is shut away from view and deals with his or her heavenly father. Even Jesus sought out this solitude and quiet to pray, the kind of praying that underpinned his ministry. Luke 5, 16, he would often withdraw to desolate places to pray. In fact, at the transfiguration, as we read in Luke 9, about eight days later, he takes with him Peter, John, and James, and goes out on the mountain to pray. I hope the point is clear. Prayer is a prerequisite for spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare will not be victorious without prayer. It is the essential condition for prayer. It is the essential ingredient for prayer. It is the essential boxing ring, as it were. It's a prerequisite for spiritual warfare, for spiritual restoration, and for spiritual victory. I ask you, do you pray? Do you speak with your Lord and Savior? God reminds Elijah that he is there. God speaks with Elijah. But thirdly, how does God go about restoring his man? 
God refocuses Elijah. But he does it in two ways. One, God shows Elijah his glory. Elijah glimpses God's glory and God's power. Verse 11 of chapter 19. Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, not all discernment had left him, for he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Charles Swindle writes, Do you see what God did? God drew Elijah out of the cave of self-pity and discouragement and depression and self-isolation with a reminder, a reminder of who it was that had called him to be a prophet to Israel in the first place, a reminder of whose power it was that had sustained him thus far, a reminder of who it was that was really God over Baal, over Asherah, over Ahab, over Jezebel and I ask you is that how you see the Lord is the Lord to you awesome glorious high and lifted up he is God all by himself father son and Holy Spirit from everlasting to everlasting he is God I ask you are you a worshiper does the glory of God occupy your thoughts, your prayers, your devotion, your study? God reminds Elijah that he is there. God speaks with Elijah and God shows Elijah his glory. If you are going to win in spiritual battles. You need to keep a vision of him who is greater than your adversary, him who is greater than the situation, him who is greater than the fight that you are fighting right now. He is high and lifted up. God all by himself. The psalmist would say in Psalm 27, allow me to quickly read there. In Psalm 27, and verse 4 one thing have i asked of the lord and that will i seek after that i may dwell in the house of the lord all the days of my life to do what to gaze upon the beauty of the lord and to inquire in his temple for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble he'll conceal me under the cover of his tent he will lift me high upon a rock to gaze verse 4 on the beauty of the lord psalm 95 verse 6 really briefly oh come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord our god and maker for he is our god and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his voice today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts God restores Elijah by nourishing him and feeding him. For us, that would be the word. That would be the word of God. That would be the scripture. That would be the Bible. But God also shows him his glory. But there's another ingredient in his restoration. You see, some dark clouds do not lift easily, do they? And even after the earthquake, even after the fire, even in answer to the still small voice, Elijah is still disillusioned. Even after seeing the glory of God, Elijah says, I'm the only one left. And they're trying to kill me. But mercy of mercies, this great, this awesome, this powerful God doesn't snuff Elijah out. The glory doesn't overwhelm him. But God does something else. God clarifies the mission. God clarifies Elijah's assignment. 
God nourishes him. God speaks with him. God shows him his glory. God clarifies his mission. Verse 15, and the Lord said to Elijah, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king of Assyria. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be the king of Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Meloha, Mehola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. The one who escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. The one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Swindle again. God shows Elijah that he still has a job to do. God shows Elijah that there was still a place for him. And I pray that through my preaching this morning, God is doing the same for you. Disillusioned and exhausted though he was, he was still God's man and God's choice for such a time as this, as Esther would be. As far as this, I'm all alone stuff went. God says, let me set the record straight, Elijah. You are not alone. There are 7,000 faithful out there who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You are not alone. God was by no means done with Elijah. Do you know, even after his ministry had passed, even after Elisha had taken up the mantle with a double anointing, God would raise others to continue God's redemptive work. Centuries later, centuries later, God would send John the Baptist, and the scripture says, in the spirit of Elijah. God, 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 was, re God was ready to use Elijah beyond the scope of his earthly life. God was not done with his man. God sent John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah once again to ready Israel for the coming of the Messiah. Speaking of the Messiah, God used Elijah to encourage Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. See, in helping Peter and John and James to process the wonder of the transfiguration, Matthew's account in Matthew 17 from verse 9 says this, And as they were coming down the mountain after the transfiguration, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And Jesus answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And here is the point, verse 13. And then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. God really was not done with Elijah to a degree that not even he could have imagined. And in the same way, breakthrough, I want to encourage you that this encouragement rings down the centuries with you, to you. God is not done with you. And God may be on the brink of doing in the spiritual victory that you are about to walk into, such a great work of extending his kingdom and bringing others to a saving knowledge of Christ, bringing others on in discipleship, bringing others on in ministry. God is about to do more than you can fathom. The ministry of Elijah transcended Hazael, transcended Jehu, transcended Elisha, all the way down the centuries to John the Baptist, transcended even him to where Elijah and Moses are standing on the Mount of Transfiguration to encourage our Lord in his ministry. How does God deal with his man? God reminds Elijah that he is there, God's presence and nourishment, his word. God speaks with Elijah, prayer, 
the prerequisite of spiritual warfare. God shows Elijah his glory that Elijah might worship him and remember whose assignment he is doing. God clarifies the mission to Elijah. And lastly but not least, next slide, God gives Elijah a close personal friend. We don't hear again of the servant of chapter 19 verse 3. But let us read from verse 19 of chapter 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, sacrificed them, and boiled their flesh with the yokes of oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him and ministered to him. God is saying to Elijah, yes, the cave is the place of prayer, but that is not the place, but isolation is not the will of God. God has not designed us to live like hermits in a cave. He has designed us to live in fellowship and friendship and community with others. That is why the church, the body of Christ, is so important. It's there that we are drawn together in love. It's there that we receive mutual encouragement. We are meant to be part of one another's lives. Otherwise, we pull back. We focus on ourselves and the spiritual battle very quickly gets too much for us. How does God restore Elijah? You can see it there on the slide. You can see it there in the text. God nourishes Elijah. God speaks with Elijah in the place of prayer. God shows Elijah his glory. God clarifies his mission for Elijah. And we have seen that that mission transcends. The scope of it is even beyond Elijah's earthly life. And God brings somebody, a friend, alongside Elijah to whom the mantle will eventually pass. My encouragement to you this morning is that in the midst of spiritual warfare, when you would check out and throw in the towel, when you're right at the point of losing like Elijah was, that this is what the Lord would wish to do in your life at this time. Allow me as I finish to turn these few simple thoughts into prayer. Father, there may be some under the sound of my voice who have very visible ministry, who are experiencing such incredible spiritual victory, glorying in your deliverance, glorying in your powerful work in their lives. And yet it is at this precise moment that Satan attacks Elijah and pulls the rug from under him. Father, I pray that you would watch over your servants. Father, I pray in particular for Noah and the other leaders of Breakthrough Ministries that you would set a shield around them, hedge them in with a mighty angelic protection. And may you find each of them individually putting on the whole armor of God. For right in the moment of victory, Satan may strike. Father, keep them walking in holiness so that their personal integrity will not be compromised. Father, deliver them, even in this moment, from any secret sin that may give Satan a foothold in their lives. 
Father, may integrity mark their ministry. May integrity mark their lives, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Father, that was a prayer for the shepherds. Now for the sheep, the people, the members of Breakthrough. Father, I pray in particular for some who may be under such spiritual strain that they would seek to just throw in the towel and walk away from it all. Father, I pray for those who may be in a difficult marriage situation that are ready to walk away from the whole lot. Father, I pray for that one in a difficult work situation where the oppression of Satan is overwhelming. Be their nourishment. Draw them out, Holy Spirit. Strengthen them even to get to the place of prayer. Feed them your word and may they find fresh, renewed delight in it, O God. Show them your glory. Show them yourself as mighty, high, lifted up, awesome, glorious. Draw out of them such deep, deep-seated worship, such deep wells of worship, O God. And Father, clarify the assignment. Father, there are some who need to walk away from jobs and some who need to stay in them. There are some who need a complete reset of their lives, Lord, and there are some whom you are about to work a mighty deliverance for. There are some who are contemplating stepping away from the ministry but encourage them, clarify their calling, clarify their ministry, clarify the anointing upon their lives, clarify their assignment, O oh God. Father, if there are any who've just cut themselves away from fellowship and closeness with other believers, Lord, I pray that you would knit them this morning to just the right person for them. For every Elijah under the sound of my voice, bring their Elisha. Excuse me. Jesus, you do not ask us to fight spiritual battles and walk a road that you yourself have not walked. I am mindful of the scripture that says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have persecution. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Father, I pray that breakthrough and every member of it will be an overcoming saint. And soon, and very soon, walk in spiritual victory. But until then, sustain them in this season of spiritual warfare. By your grace and by your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.